As I was saying, I want that Pikachu, and this time, don't screw it up. Well, boss, why are we even going after the Pikachu? It's, it's not that good of a Pokemon. Meow, meow. Uh, I, that's a good question. Why are we after that Pikachu? Well, you see, boss, I looked up this site called Smogon, and it's not a very good Pokemon there. They're saying it's down near, uh, near, like, hardly ever used. I think that's yuck tier. So, I'm just saying, we need to get you, like, a, well, like a Gachomp or something. That's a much better idea. Those are way cooler. I don't know why we've been chasing after this same kid for, like, 15 years. He loses every time he goes to the Elite Four. It really shouldn't be that high a priority. Okay, m memo to all members. No more Pikachu hunting. We're, we're going after the rarer stuff now. Yeah, well, everybody will get a Dialga or a Palkia, because, you know, just being able to destroy time and space is just the thing that we and Team Rocket ought to be able to do, meow, meow. That's a brilliant idea. Clear my schedule. We're going after the big guys now. And I am suffering, I'm suffering from a terrible cold, apparently, that just kind of decided to whoop my butt today. I am the Hipster Snack, here with my dear, beloved companions, and I apparently sound awful. I'm just going to preemptively apologize. You, you sound fantastic, my friend. You should get head colds more often. You do, actually. You should you should do this ill more often. It actually where everybody else normally has really crappy voices when they sound ill, you sound like an octave deeper. Yeah. You you sound fantastic right now. <laughs> actually I, I, I would normally take that as just like, oh hey, that's a good trade off. But no, like I actually just I wake up like every two hours during the night coughing and I already took last Friday off for hopes that I would just get over this and, and it Ooh. actually seems worse now. So as I was saying, I'm the hipster snack, and these are my beloved companions. With me today is of course World Tree Cycles. <laughs> or Detaku, whichever. I answer to many names. Uh, I've introduced you in my videos as World Tree Cycles due to your Twitter handle. Well, I mean, uh, but I am also Lady Taku. That's I will answer to that too. Over here, we have Cog of Cog Sound Engineering. Links now in all of my videos for the amazing sound editing work that this man has put forth. <laughs> I appreciate that. You know what? You know what? You better be careful. After, if you put your voice in now into his protocols with your sexy filter, you're just going to be like, it's just going to have the careless whisper just, <laughs> ladies, <laughs> ladies, contain yourselves. So you better be careful. I'm just saying. The snack is single. Oh, man. We're off to a banging start today. Speaking of banging, <laughs> Neptunia, what is it about? Hyperdimension Neptunia. The full official title, I actually double-checked this. The official title of this anime is actually Hyperdimension Neptunia The Animation. Probably for best results, best to have already watched episodes 1 through 12 plus the episode 13 OVA, which is the entire series. Right now, there's actually, David Productions is starting a new series based off of V2. Really? But for right now. This is the entirety of the Neptunia animation experience. So what is Neptunia? What, what is Neptunia? Is it a game? Is it a visual novel? Is it a deep sense of shame that your parents feel whenever they're like, hello, so, oh, and they walk away? The best part is it's all that and so much more. <laughs> you see, Neptunia actually started off as a series of PS3 exclusive JRPGs. And the thing that's really 
maybe not great, but interesting is that the first game in particular pioneered a lot of really previously unseen mechanics into how an RPG will run. And I'll talk more about that in the after hours, but to put a fine point on it, it wasn't really what one might accidentally call a good game on account that it wasn't. Oh, I think you could accidentally call it a good game because that's not something you intend to do. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it wasn't really a good game. Now what it was, was a thing of interest. And clearly extremely marketable. They, they saw something there that if they polished it and ran with it, they could make something much, much better. In fact, one of the game devs that vouched for Neptunia's authenticity very early on in its life was KG and Afune, the Mega Man guy. Uh, yes, because the next game in the series, and I'm not I'm not pooping on anybody, <laughs> effectively is Breath of Fire 6, before Breath of Fire 6 became a thing. It used the same battle system as Breath of Fire 5, and you replace the main characters with dragon people. I mean, that's basically what it would be. The main thing is transformation and using a movement-based, weird hybrid action RPG, standard JRPG thing. So the, the thing of beauty is that every game proves upon that which came before it. Then when it got to its third major game, Victory, they ended up having a series of re-releases called the Rebirth series, and those are on Steam for those who actually want to play them. Am I going to cover Neptunia on the Snack channel? Eventually, but not immediately. Maybe in 2020. However, after those games were released, David Animations spent all their money making JoJo Part 1 and 2 as awesome as possible. So they had to get a cash <laughs> yes, injection <laughs> with as minimal effort as possible. So, of course, lowest common denominator equals hyperdimension Neptunia. Now, I'm, 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 being, I'm being half facetious. Half facetious. It definitely comes across as a budget title. I wish I could find it because... The backlash after David Productions, you know, hit it out of the park with JoJo, and then they saw that they were doing Neptunia the next season. There were people who were butthurt, and it wasn't just like the JoJo guys. Jesu Otaku, I remember this very vividly, was like extremely put out by it. She's like, I'm not going to watch this. This is anime porn. Ugh. <laughs> I'm like, it looks like a cute girls doing cute thing anime. I knew nothing about it at the time. And I mean, I was more or less right, which just proves to you how how high my power level really is. And, you know, actually having got into the series, because here, uh, just, just for point of reference, I have played all the Rebirth games and V2. I have not done anything else. I did not play the original game, nor really am I going to, because... Going back to the Rebirth games after playing V2, it's like, I really miss V2's battle system. It's just, it's so much better. A thing that does help with context a bit is I'm responsible for these guys knowing that Neptunia exists. And that's because a friend of mine told me about it, and then I complained at great length that JoJo is being put on hiatus on its account. To which I was... So you were one of the butter I was. Guys. On the onset, <laughs> I'll be honest, on the onset, I was. And that's when my friend challenged me and he said, Snack, you have to play it before you knock it. You can't just take a swipe at this series that you know nothing about or you become just another one of those whining internet guys who doesn't have a basis to stand on. You and I said, fine, that's fair. yeah. He's got you there, dude. No, that's fair. That's fair. And and I and I accepted it. I ran out to GameStop like two days later after that conversation. And I picked up a copy of the first game. I played it. And I was like, that wasn't a great game. This is in no way competition for Monster Rancher 4. But it had my interest. And I felt that there was a lot of potential, especially since there were already sequels out. Now, I'm telling the story a little bit out of order. I actually played the second game first. The first game I wasn't able to play until later on. And that that puts things in context, because like I said, mechanically, the first game yes. is not exactly great. Mark 2. Mark 2, 
I played first, and I was about halfway through Mark Two when I got the first, which introduced my favorite girl. Which is a very important thing. I feel right now we need to we, just before we go because it's such a central aspect of the series. It's time. It is time for the Detaku Power Hour. Warning. It is a non-stop spoiler onslaught going forward. Abandon all pretenses, ye who enter here. Gun to your heads, guys. You ready? Favorite girl. Gotta put it out there. Because this is so central to the series and its success. We gotta air our dirty laundry. We better do it now, in the beginning. That is fair. My nep waifu did not exist when this anime was made. So if it has to be one of the girls that showed up in the context of the anime, I would go with Ray Wrights because I've dated crazier. Really? You're not going to go with Vert? Vert is a very close contender. And if Victory didn't exist and it was only the first game in Mark II available to me, yes, Vert would probably win that. Okay. How about you, Cog? So this is going to be an interesting show because um, I'm a bit of a newcomer, a little bit more of a newcomer to Neptunia. I have a passing knowledge of it. I've seen elements of the game. Uh, I've seen playthroughs of the game and things like that. I haven't actually sat down and played it myself. But that being said, just going based off, I guess, the animation, I think that my favorite I'd actually just say my favorite characters are probably Neptunia and Noir. My favorite is the Game Gear herself, Miss Nep Gear. And I got to say, Mark II, or rather Rebirth II, holds a special place in my heart because it's basically, you know, her debut as a heroine. But, oh man, they done her wrong in this. And they done her wrong so many times because of the reaction of Mark II. It is It, it saddens me. Been no end. We'll cover that in just a sec. Before we go on, I do want to clarify the anime is a very, very abridged retelling of Rebirth 2 and 3 or Mark 2 and Victory. Same game, same storyline. The first game in the series actually retconned itself out of continuity, and the later games hadn't happened yet. So this is just covering two games. And those two games are Rebirth 2 and 3. Yeah, they kind of address this with Rebirth 1, where they're just like, yeah, and then they lived happily ever after, which is then other games. So, Neptunia, we begin with a place called Game Industry. The series begins with a peace treaty between several kingdoms ruled by different CPUs or goddesses. Um, the main ones are Lestation, ruled by Blackheart, Lawi, ruled by Whiteheart, Leanbox, ruled by Greenheart, and Plan of Tune ruled by Purple Heart. And something that I immediately kind of have a little bit of a gripe about with this series for newcomers, something you really have to know about Neptunia if you're coming from it from a complete newcomer perspective, is all of these characters are representation of game consoles. And they don't explain that really at all. In the anime, I mean, there's just obviously Neptunia loves it. Some in jokes. Oh, my. Yes. They, they really don't address it in the games, to be honest. It's really just one of those things you're supposed to know from meta knowledge. Yes. And I have a rant about that that I'm going to put in the after hours because I don't want this to be Ditaku about the games. Because even though I love the games, I have some opinions. Old man yells at cloud based consoles. You know what? You know what? You know what? I mean, just because you're right doesn't mean you can talk crap like that. Essentially, from that point, we have this peace treaty where all the kingdoms are reaching a friendship alliance where they are agreeing to no longer fight over what they call share energy anymore. It's supposed to be the belief and the faith of their citizens. And the entire thing being is that Travel between kingdoms is effectively, there's no restrictions. So the entire thing being is that a goddess has to keep her people happy and safe because the entire thing is there are monsters and stuff out there. And so she has to keep her kingdom happy and safe. 
Otherwise, she will lose the share energy that she needs to survive, and she will basically wither away, whereupon a new goddess will emerge from the share energy and take her place. Literally the market share. Or get sealed away slash forgotten in another dimension. Neptunia is weird in that how easy it is to... The specifications for how CPUs work is spotty, inconsistent, and then there's actually a multiverse element that actually just muddies the water, so let's not get into that. Yes, because, I mean, Neptune mentions that she has a mother who was the earlier CPU, Uranus, but then there is a predecessor that she constantly mentions in both her attacks in the anime and in the games that's not this mother, and that's not even getting into the Mark II where they have the legendary goddess that used the demon blade that consumes CPU souls. Which is only seen once in the OVA episode during Netgear's nightmare sequence. Anime Gehaburn. It's it's the best purple sword. But literally Gehaburn. Anime Gehaburn is a DLC item. And the fact that I know this difference proves just how much of a huge, pathetic nerd I am. I, I think your YouTube channel also confirms this, but I'm just saying. You're, you're not wrong, and it doesn't <laughs> help. But I, to, For everyone listening, I have done full screenshot Let's Plays of the first three games, analyzing them in far greater detail than they've ever deserved. <laughs> and I even briefly talked about the fighting games, and briefly mentioned the idol game because yes, I owned a Vita at one point, bought used, obviously. You and three other people. Yeah, I know, right? And I played the idol game, which was considered so boring that they didn't even bother porting it to Steam. I think it is over to Steam now. But. I let me double check that. We want to be, you know, a historically accurate podcast. We are a bastion of research here, folks. So anyways, as well, Snack is doing that, why don't you uh, regale us with more, Cog, because I want to hear your side of this. I Snack and I watched this series together because I actually own physical discs of this one. Well, I mean, the show basically follows our leading CPU ladies from each of the different nations, the primary ones being Neptune, Noir, Blanc, and Vert which are the main goddesses for Planeptune, Lestation, Lowey, and Leanbox. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe Lestation is PlayStation. It's Sony, particularly the PS3 and 4. Lowey is Nintendo, Leanbox is Microsoft, and Planeptune was actually like a canceled console. Yes. Planeptune is actually supposed to be Sega, believe it or not. Which was supposed to be a standalone 32X. The non-existent Sega Neptune, yes. Which is kind of interesting because they decided to base the main character of the show on something that actually just doesn't exist. To say it takes liberties with gaming history is like calling the ocean a bit wet. Here's the thing. In the next series, we get to see the best console. And she is awesome but i'm yeah i'm gonna wait until we inevitably have people being like oh why don't you do neptunia 2 uh neptunia producing perfection is not on steam but they do have a complete bundle of literally all the main games uh, it doesn't appear to include dlc for like 150 dollars and that includes the newest one super neptunia rpg and the mobile game neptunia shooter uh, so if people want to get into the series, there's a very easy and cost-effective way of doing so. There, there, there you go, IFI. I have filleted you. You're welcome. I, honestly, the way that it helps me there, Cog, is to think of it as two groups of heroines. You have the four main CPUs, and they don't really go into this, unfortunately. You have the four CPUs, and then you have their CPU candidates, who are supposed to be basically the c CPUs in training, which is my girl... Uni, which is supposed to be the Vita, Ram and uh, Ram and Rom. See, and here's the thing: Leanbox doesn't have one, but that's because Vert is actually supposed to be the CPU candidate. But that's just a game theory. <laughs> our, our good buddy here has his own head cannon concerning Microsoft would be the actual CPU, whereas the Xbox Series would actually be the candidate. And I don't. I don't hate this idea, but it's very clear that they are in no hurry because Vert being a weird syscon is one of the most common running gags 
in the series. So it's not going to happen anytime soon because once they decide they like a stupid joke, they stick with it. Yeah, but it would be so good because then it explains the reason why she wants to have a sister. Because think about how awful an actual PC Chan would be to Xbox. It's like, you're out of date, but I can be cool and I run Halo, but you're out of date. But, 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 and you also break all the time. Oh, I'm going to go play with Game Gear. Man. Yeah, for for those who are curious, PCs in Neptunia world are relegated to an optional island area on the overworld map. And yet they'll dedicate an entire character to the PC-98, which was honestly just a Japanese exclusive ZX Spectrum guru, Larry. Uh, yes, uh, that's that's Pishi, the Yellow Heart which is a antagonist slash sidekick character from the second half of the series, and which is on top of that also the reason why she has her little bee hoodie, because guess what company was responsible for that? Hudson Soft. Uh, R&P in peace, Hudson. Hudson Soft. Press F to pay respects, gents. It's such a shame they died, but, you know. But um, as far as the plot, that's basically it. We just have a series of interchanging villains. and Neptunia does not deviate far from the old JRPG Bible. There's a threat. The CPUs bicker among themselves until they realize said threat is present. The CPUs band together, declare their undying friendship and loyalty to one another. They beat the villain, and then they go back to what they were doing before because everyone has a circular character arc because they believe that just because it's a comedy that they can't be arsed to actually write characters properly. That's a major complaint I have about the series as a whole, anime and games included. You know you know who does have an arc, though? Uh, Nepgear, of all people. Yeah, Nepgear. In the first game, she is extremely, extremely unsure of herself, but she kind of digs deep and becomes the person that she wants to be. And by V2, she actually has an entire sub-arc where she's basically running a rebel resistance against... The new enemy, who I'm not going to go into because I don't want Snek to get, you know, any hives because, ooh, spoilers, I'm allergic to them. Uh, I'm not ever going to be one of those channels that just plays the game to completion because you're supposed to play the game for yourselves after I review them for you. So I guess we need to talk about the villains, essentially, because that's really what moves Neptunia forward is each ah, yes. essential antagonist that R4 comes in and out. The first major antagonist is the first major antagonist from the games, a voluptuous witch lady known as R4, named for the R4 chip that was commonly used to copy pirated games on the Nintendo DS. She's also the major villain of both the first and second games. It's very subtle the way they go about this because she has this weird pyramid scheme whereupon she hands out these small chips to children where the chips can unfold and become game consoles and you can straight up download game ROMs off the internet right into the game console. The thing being ultimately is that these things will sap your energy and utilize that as fake share energy and she becomes a demon god of sorts using this this fake share energy. Uh, they kind of, kind of go over this with the entire, her ultimate scheme of trapping the CPUs. But un- unfortunately in the, in the interest of, of brevity, they don't really go into ultimately how insidious the plot is, especially in Mark II. And, and who, if you have R4, who, how can you forget her, her little buddies, Warichu? I mean, he's literally in every game. Yeah, Warachu is one of the few characters who, in the process of translation, has actually had multiple names. In the first run of the games, back when Nisa Software did the translocalizations of the Neptunia games, he was known as Pirachu, coming from Pirate. Then, once IFI became a thing, and they started doing their own in-house localizations, even though the Japanese script never changed, he became Werichu, his, which is his actual Japanese name coming from Wares. Isn't this supposed to be like a shareware thing? Yeah, basically. Wares with a Z being a common 
nowadays out of date term for pirated software. Yeah, and the entire thing being is that his model in game has him, you know, just kind of standing rather smugly with an entire just batch of burned DVDs. And you can imagine what's on those burned DVDs, so piracy's bad, okay? Yeah, that's that's a thing in the entire series. It's like if you are a pirate or you enable pirates, you are literally enabling Satan. And you will bring about the end of all of creation with absolutely no exceptions because literally you copy that floppy, you go to hell. Which is funny considering that the main villain of a bunch of the later games is actually these demonic, you know, false gods, but actually CPUs that are just butthurt that why, why are they worshiping these four losers? They should be worshiping me. Yeah. So our four's motivation is pretty cut and dry. And then you get the wonderful and rather infamous eggplant episode. Cog, I want to hear your thoughts on this episode before I explain it. The eggplant episode was actually probably one of the funnier episodes. I thought the whole transformation into egg ore was was actually quite entertaining. <laughs> it's it's definitely a special, very interesting episode. You see most of the characters don't actually have very developed personalities. So very few of them have canonical likes and dislikes. Neptunia, um, rather Neptune is kind of an exception to this as Neptune's favorite food is stated to be pudding. Rebirth one actually does a really good job explaining her least favorite food is eggplant, which I think is really weird as they pick the one purple vegetable to be the thing that she hates. I think that's supposed to be ironic, actually. Also, not gonna lie, uh, eggplant in in most in most cooked situations is kind of gross. So, I mean, I can kind of understand. Yeah, I, I'm kind of with Neptune on this. Uh, that stuff's really not fit for human consumption. Now, the, the a common theme you'll actually see is the series really is funniest right before one of the most like serious and plot moving episodes, rather than doing what Mark II did, and just having the CPUs defeated at the start of the story, they're imprisoned using these things called the Anticrystals, which is an anime-only series of these little red jewels that R4 uses to create this, like, anti-CPU pyramid and locks them all in. Honestly, honestly, having played Rebirth 2 after hearing the how Mark II had happened and then seeing it for myself and going... They were being drained of their essence for how long and no one did anything? Three years. And then after that, after that's the start of the game. When you get Nepgear, <laughs> the main character of Mark II, and then you have to spend three quarters of the game running around getting the other CPU candidates. And let me tell you, you think that Blonde, you think that Vert... You think that Noir has no personality. Oh, my God. Trying to convince Uni, Miss Little little Miss Vita, you know, please, please join, please join my team. <laughs> you want to join our team, right? I mean, you want to join, help your big sister? No. Well, why not? Because I'm the Sindere one, and that's my only character trait. Meh. Well, that's... Right. To say that the anime is much better paced than the games is a bit of an understatement. Yeah, for context, <laughs> in Mark II, Rebirth 2, you start off with the CPUs having been held in r Force captivity for three full <laughs> years before the heroes decide to act and do something. And I've heard a couple people attempt to rationalize this, but you can't. The whole thing in the games being they use the, uh, a Sherisite crystal to try to free them, which doesn't work. That actually frees Nepgear, who was also caught in the game. And that's when the story actually picks up. Whereas in the anime, I think they did it way, way better by having them spring the trap very suddenly. They're in captivity like a day before they launch their attack plan. So it's much better paced. And then you get to see Nepgear's arc about her self-doubt come into fruition of her being, you know, I'm strong on my own and transforming for the first time. It all goes much more organically. It's a lot less...
than the game. I will concede that just the one thing that kind of bothered me was the fact that Snack is right on this one. The entire thing being is that Nepgear's entire plan through Mark II is to go, it's all right, I'll gather the other CPU candidates and together we can do this when ultimately she had the power to save the goddesses from the beginning. It's just she didn't believe in herself. She just blocked herself off and thought, oh, I need other people to do this. Which, I mean, I get there wouldn't be a game otherwise. The thing being, though, is the fact that it's they, they tie that to her actually getting her goddess powers when she starts out in her goddess form in Mark II. That's not the problem, but... Sort of. You start in her goddess form in Rebirth 2 up until you can't. You actually have that power sealed for the better part of the first chapter of the game. And the way they give it to her is Linda who is known as underling for the vast majority of the series. Ah, yes. Minion. Yeah. The, the, the (laughs) pale, the pale girl who helped the fat clown Greymon trick kidnap the CPU candidates in Louis. Yeah, no, she's a a very big deal. You fight her eight or nine times over the course of Mm -hmm. rebirth two, which mind you is like a 30 hour game. So it's entirely too much, which is also sad because the one character who really should have gotten multiple boss fights, you fight him once, and then he's like, yeah, I, I'm going now, bye. Yeah, Brave, who doesn't show up in the anime at all. Anyway, to, to give you an idea of how stupid the game's handling of Neptune's, no, rather, Neptune's entire arc, she gets her goddess powers because IF just randomly kisses her. I am not making this up. I am not exaggerating. It's literally that stupid and that cut and dry. Yes, but Snack, you see, you also are forgetting there's literally a Lily rank system that powers up. Yeah, the, the incredibly unsubtle Yuri rank, where unless everyone in your party is enamored with Netgear, you are barred from the true ending. There's a reason I vastly would rather watch the anime than play Rebirth 2 again. And I hate to say it because, yeah, Rebirth 2 is a fun game, but Rebirth 2 is also fluffed to hell and back. That's why V2 is better. I mean, you get better characters, you get everybody, everybody, there's no real faffing about. But, but to be fair, to be fair, the way the anime handles Mark II's overall arc, which is the first half of the series, is really, really well done. It is briskly paced, you're introduced to the characters, you see the villain, you see the plot, you get a few cameos for those who are already fans, like you get to see 5PB, she sings in one episode. And doesn't uh, Mages show up too? I will say I have to side with the sub on this one just because you brought up 5PB because, man, just from an observing standpoint, I did not like the English dub for that concert. Really? No, I do not. like. I I really do not like when they try to take full foreign language songs and try to redub them in English because you get these really strange word phrasings and it makes the song sound weird. That's actually just a thing in Neptunian music. If you read the lyrics, even like even the opening theme song to this anime, Dimension Tripper, let's talk about that for a second. The lyrics are nonsense. It's a series of word salads. And that's how all Neptunia songs are. They're these really catchy J-pop songs that don't make any sense. Right. I'm not actually referring to the content of the lyrics, more so how they are audibly sung. This is I know this is me putting on my audio music snob hat. But you're, you're the music guy, so that that's yeah, that's your special. Because most of the time, and especially when you have a fully foreign language song with no English or anything else mixed in, when they try to do these like full lyrical translations, most of the time they don't tend to take well with the rhythm of the music. And it's usually just due to translations and the structural differences of words between the languages. But yeah, I absolutely hate hearing when they do that stuff. And I would much rather listen to the song in its original Japanese. I mean, you, you, not that you can go wrong. Neptune is Tari, uh, Re. Rie Takanaka, and she is outstanding. But, I mean, honestly, as much as I'm probably going to get blowback from Professor Sneck here, I, I think I have to honestly prefer the dub on this one just because uh, Melissa Fawn voices Neptune, and she is just a treat in everything that she does. Oh, no, I, I actually wholeheartedly agree with you. 
I mean, I, I do agree. The overall dub is still good. I mean, Neptune is one of the best dubbed and I think easily one of the most entertaining characters for me as far as the anime. I'd be remiss to also say, um, because she's basically Snack's uh, voice actress waifu, <laughs> but uh, Christina V is Compa or Compile Heart, the actual developers who do the games. Compa is pretty adorable. Yep. Now, this is one of those things where I... I respect where you're coming from, Cog, and you're a music man. You know more about this stuff technically than I could ever hope to figure out. Now, the thing is, I go hard dub Neptunia because, honestly, a lot of the voice actresses in this series do double duty. This is incredibly obvious in the games in particular because, like, there's a villain named Magic who doesn't show up in the anime but she looks like and sounds like R4 because they share voice actresses, dub, and subversion. But when I listen to the subversion of Neptunia, and I'm going to get blowback for this statement, but I'm going on record and saying it, a lot of Japanese voice actresses sound exactly the same. Not to say they have the same voice, but they have the same intonation, and they all tend to have that high-pitched, squeaky, kya <laughs> voice that just really grates on you after a while. I said it. They're high pitched. There are these high pitched whistles Ooh. that only dogs can hear, Ooh. and it's unpleasant to listen to. I don't like it. And when you have a series where the cast is 99.9% .9 female, they'll have a lot of recurring voice actresses. There's one male. No, there's two males in the entire yeah, there's anime. Like, I think there's, there's like where are you? And Anani Death. Who I have to say is yeah, uh, Anani Death, who's who is a joy every time he's on screen. It, I really, really like Anani Death, both in his game and just because he's basically supposed to be Two Chan. And the entire thing is, is that basically, if there was just an amalgam character, having been on many, many hours on a certain underwater Chinese basket weaving forum, if I was to imagine just the average Anon, it basically would be Anani Death. Really really flamboyant, thinks too highly of himself, and is simultaneously girl crazy, but also really gay. That, that basically is a naughty death, and he's just out, he really funny character. Yeah, no, he is. And actually, that takes us into the second half of the series, where you actually do an adaptation of Victory, which is mercifully abridged into kind of two sub-arcs. You get the, the Pishi arc, and then you get the Ray Wright's arc. They're intimately tied together in the game, actually. Yeah, which is unfortunate because that's going to make the next season really interesting when they have to introduce the ultimate baddie of Victory, who's a big deal in V2. And yet, whoops, she wasn't in the prior season. So uh, how's that going to work? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they'll, they'll, they'll finagle something. Oh, uh, yes, Quar. You had so many excellent lines in, in Neptunia, the animation. You know, that, that itself could be a joke, honestly, given how how much they lean on the fourth wall. The, the second arc picks up with a little girl named Pishi, who we mentioned briefly before, who recognizes IF and Kampa, but doesn't tell anyone why, because that would actually spoiler the entire plot of the rest of the anime and make things way too easy. <laughs> Seriously, they, they literally just gloss over it. The game actually handles it more organically, but then you're spending 70 hours of listening to the same joke over and over again to get to that point. They actually make a reference to that. I, I was uh, pushing forward on my save file of Victory a few hours ago, and I had this moment where Neptune turns, stops, turns to the other characters and goes, guys, I think we're in a loop. And Kampa goes, what do you mean? So says, we're going to open that door. Histoire is going to come to us and go, it's an emergency. And we're going to get some crazy situation, which is going to cause us to go to another boss encounter. And we're going to have to do this. And the other characters just go, no, no, that's not going to happen. And then, lo and behold, she opens the door. Histoire's there. It's an emergency. And they get sent to another dungeon. And I'm like, oh, my God. The game itself knows that it's a giant grindy slog. Think, yeah, like I said, the anime is much more briskly paced. And if you want a crash course on the first three games, just watch the anime. It'll save you a lot of time, and you'll pick up pretty much the same experience. Now, with Pishi also comes Plutia, who is oftentimes for newcomers one of the bigger surprises uh, because she is a CPU as well. 
Cog, tell us about your first time seeing Iris Hart. No, she was pretty early. She was pretty early because she showed up like right after when P. She showed up. And it's funny because they have her, they actually have her parodying um, Neptune's first interaction with Kampa and IF in Rebirth 1, where she just literally straight up falls on them and impales herself in the ground. I would say she is actually one of the more interesting characters on the show. I mean, the fact that you have such a stark change between from like the original versus the transformed version, whereas you have a lot of the characters just getting older and it's a very minor transformation. But this one is a lot more obvious and she just turns into this dominatrix type character and I actually really enjoyed her because she had this whole thing about her where she like wants to torment people because I mean in her dark way she seems to just want people to be honest with themselves which I thought was very interesting that that they explain that actually in victory they kind of gloss over it the thing being is that she actually comes from an alternate dimension where it's much earlier in the timeline she's actually based off the Sega Genesis and the entire thing with that is that goddesses in her world actually rely on these gems in order to become goddesses and that you have to basically go through a rite of initiation whereupon if you do not if you're not deemed worthy then you will be transformed into a horribly disfigured monster so the implication especially with the history between her and a, a the nation of louis is that she's actually extremely old as a as the deities deity CPUs go. So it's just that she has her youthful appearance because she got the goddess gem really early on in her life. And basically, once you have that, boom, that's the way you're going to look for the rest of your life. And I need to adjust my glasses and bow tie here and be all actually... She represents the Sega Saturn. Uh, yes, the, the Mega Drive. I'm sorry, Europeans and also Japanese people. S- Sega Saturn. The Sega Saturn, really? It's the Mega Drive. Saturn. Nope. She represents the Saturn. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you want to talk about, you know, games where or game systems that only five people bought and you weren't even you didn't even have one. I wasn't even one yes, of them. And yet you're like, but 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 my burning rangers, but my burning rangers <laughs> uh, is, that's going to show up on the channel eventually. Underrated game. Look it up. It's but awesome. my nights into dreams. But 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 no one that nights over in the dreams is overrated because <laughs> you know what? I'll save that for for after hours. Moreover, Plutia is a very direct character. But, okay, so my entire thing, though, before other than that, <laughs> am I wrong, Professor? No, that's pretty much spot on. Uh, I mean, go ahead. I, I won't interrupt anymore. No, I, I was just saying, Plutia is a very direct character. And while they don't really talk about it in the anime, she is kind of like the white mage of the party. Yeah. <laughs> she, she actually has all the healing powers. It's funny because she di- simultaneously has the white mage, but then she transforms. And for instance, in the eggplant episode, they mimic one of her most powerful attacks where she literally starts to take on kind of the violent sadomasochistic personality, which is supposed to kind of be what she's actually like, according to later parts of Victory. And she just starts violently beating up her stuffed animal, which proceeds to just destroy her enemies around her. So, yeah, she's basically simultaneously a barbarian and also a white mage. She's a really weird character. But she really is a a very push-the-plot-forward kind of character because of that. When she's in CPU form, at least, in her human form, she and Neptune actually drag Victory's plot to a crawl. This is fascinating listening to this because I have not personally played through any of these games. I have mostly a passing knowledge of Neptunia based on stuff that Mr. Sneck had educated me on in the past combined with my own YouTube browsing. And it really is interesting to hear about these overarching plots that they've cut out because honestly, if you're just a complete newcomer to Neptunia, it's just this kind of funny entertaining magical girl show it's not exactly anything super incredible to write home about i mean as we talked about it does appear very 
obviously is a budget title when comparing Jojo versus Neptunia from David Productions. And it at least appeared to me, at least in the games, that, I mean, it seems like you would be expecting a lot more action and combat and things. It uses a turn system, but at the same time, instead of just having your guys lined up and then the monsters, you basically have to maneuver your characters around um, during your turn and actually have to worry about your facing, kind of like in a, uh, a strategy RPG. And um, also on top of that, you have to worry about your range because, for instance, uh, my, my, my favorite character from R2, Uni, has a gun. And her entire thing is her gun, despite what guns do, where they can just, you know, from the, the barrel to wherever their maximum range is, they can just shoot bullets. No, she has a minimum range, like she's got a howitzer. So you have to worry about, oh, can you actually, can I hit the character because I'm I'm far enough away from people and what have you. It's, it's an interesting and nice compromise between just having straight up just classic JRPGs, as I, as I kind of mentioned before, or having an action RPG. You have to be very mindful as to where your enemy is and also what they can do. Which, for something like that, I mean, even a show based on the game, I was kind of hoping for a bit more in terms of the animation because there are a lot of escalations into combats and then you know, you have the girls transform and then they just kind of swipe their weapons a couple times and we're done moving on. So don't expect any of the combat to be really detailed, like what we just came from, like what we saw in Jojo, for example. I, I mean, to be perfectly honest, the reason why I brought up the characters and, and because ultimately the games themselves are not particularly deep. You're not going to be dealing. You're not you're not going to be dealing with like. Final Fantasy Tactics, Dancer, Calculator, Underflow Error, you know, <laughs> 15 turns and I'll be able to kill them all. ha <laughs> Type of like, you know, you have to think that, no, it's, it's not. It's slightly above the brain dead push A to win every battle. <laughs> uh, the, the main draw of the games is the cute girls. You get to see, look, here's Tekken as a girl. Look. Here's Senron Kagura as a girl. If you can believe that, look, it's Bamco as a girl. Look, it's Square Enix as a girl. Look, this is what Microsoft Xbox would look as a girl. Yeah, the characters themselves and the gaming references are really why you get into Neptunia. And if you really start out watching just the anime, you may very well end up being like I was, where you end up pulling up the wiki on one side and looking up who everyone is supposed to be. So I will say there is definitely a barrier to entry into the Neptunia franchise in general. It's simultaneously really obvious and also simultaneously way denser than it has any right to be for something that's that really is like Babby's first abridged history lesson on not even not even current event, not even ancient history game consoles. It's based off of the 360 Wii PlayStation 3 generation. That That's ultimately what the original game was based off of. And those are what the goddesses that you see in the animation are supposed to be. In V2, they, they get what they call upgrades, which are supposed to be, I believe, the Xbox One, the PlayStation 4, and I want to say the Wii U. I think it's based on the Wii U because the Switch didn't exist yet. Yeah, but, you know, speaking of another video game system that only five people bought and Snack also bought. Yep. <laughs> I will say the series has a lot of fun, lighthearted moments. I will say... If you're a gamer, but you aren't quite as entrenched into a lot of like the console business histories of gaming, you will still probably get a lot of the overall gaming references. I mean, that's probably part of why I enjoyed some of the storylines like Noir getting hacked. I immediately, you know, was able to notice, oh, we're, we're doing that time Sony had that big hack situation. And that was a cute little thing that they did with that in the show. And then it has, but it has a lot of fun moments. And I mean, Neptunia herself, I think has my favorite personality in the show because she has this just smart aleck attitude. And another interesting part, I did really enjoy post the eggplant episode 
when after they beat Alfor and she goes, oh, I just bought this entire eggplant farm and spent all my money. And she just goes, you know what? Forget the whole thing. I'm I'm done. I'm done being a villain. <laughs> that actually is a reference to her victory counterpart. The entire thing being in victory that you tra- you go to uh, Neptune, goes to another dimension, and encounters alternate dimension versions of all of her friends. There are four, much like that, becomes a villain and basically gets beat the f- out almost immediately, and then she becomes an eggplant farmer, which you see a bit of in the OVA episode. I think that's why I like that moment so much, because if you think about it, it's like all the time when you encounter the villain, it's this, we have to capture them, we have to kill them, we are, or we have to destroy them. And this is just one of those moments where that doesn't happen. The villain just kind of goes, you know what? I'm going to retire. Yep. Well, the thing is, the R4 in Mark II is a crazed goddess gone wrong. The R4 of the alternate dimension where Plutia is from is just a witch who has really great magical power. So when she gets beaten, she's just like, nope, I'm done. I am so done. Do you want Do you want to be spoiled a little bit there, Cog? Sure. Warichu in, in V2 actually gets a good end. He gets a girlfriend, <laughs> he settles down, and he basically is just kind of in a good moment. All ironically, thanks to the fact that he basically got brainwashed by the villain of that game. So, I mean, both both R4 and Warichu get their good ends eventually. Yeah, she, she retires and and Warichu, Warichu gets kind of like a legit moment. All right, I think that brings us to our final villain, Ray Wright. Snacks, waifu. I don't understand the appeal. Because once you've dated a certain degree of crazy, you just don't know how to operate without. Yes, but that's your problem. You don't remember Plato's law of hotness to, you know, insanity ratio. And that's your problem there, Professor. You forget the the eternal sage's advice on hotness to craziness. There are a lot of enjoyable reference moments, like with Ray Wright. I know one that I definitely appreciated with Atari and everything, where she's talking about getting thrown away in the trash. And, you know, I immediately appreciated the E.T. reference there. And one of my favorite gags of the show was when they first entered Nintendo Town and Neptune is attacked by like a giant turtle and she's shouting it about it, trying to take her peaches. Oh, the, the turtles after her peaches. In the, in the same episode, not, not long after that bit, there's one I really like where Ram and Ram see the dragon coins and they're like, maybe we should grab some for Blonde. And Ram's like, yeah, if we get a hundred of them, maybe she'll finally get a life. And the one that, that got me, because I'm a huge fan, after Neptune has seen Plutia transform and she insists on carrying her while they're flying, and Plutia's like, oh, come on, I could just hinge in a go-go, baby, and transform too. <laughs> yes, he, he audibly laughed out loud, and I just kind of had to shake my head because, you know, of course... Of course, the the Clover Studio fanboy is going to, you know, be like, beautiful Joe, beautiful Joe. (laughs) But overall, I would say, at least from a newcomer's perspective, I would say the show is probably something you might watch in addition to playing the games. If you really want to get more of the backstory and everything is what it sounds like. Which is kind of funny, as I was literally about to say the opposite. I feel the anime is a replacement for the first three games. The reason I say that is because, first off, the games are very long. But they're not long in terms of gameplay. They're long in terms of Hideo Kojima writing. <laughs> uh, except, except, like, worse. <laughs> You're just saying that because you decided to do a screen cap LP of each game and you never decided to paraphrase. So if anyone No, I, I started paraphrasing towards the end, actually. I mean, that that's entirely on you. But moreover, you realize when you're doing that and you're actually like analyzing everything that's being said the way you do in a let's play, you realize how little is actually being said. <laughs> and Victory in particular is a bad culprit of this. And they say so much more, but they're actually conveying 
way less information. Which is funny because as a person who only started with the Rebirth games, I honestly think that Rebirth 3, or Victory, honestly is one of the betters and better ones in terms of the gameplay. Oh, no, absolutely. The most characters, right. the fact that there's the juxtaposition of the classic CPUs that you know, and then their older versions, because then you have the alternate blonde that's based off the Famicom, you have alternate Bert, who's based off the original Xbox, and then you have alternate Noir, who's based off the PlayStation. Uh, PS2 and Noir, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it's... No, she, she's, she's PS2. That's why she has the blue and black thing. Really? She's not PSX? Nope, she's PS2. Mm-hmm. One of the running gags that comes up with her a lot is she talks about how she's trying to future-proof. She's trying to future-proof everything. That comes from an E3 conference of the PS2. Press X wow. to doubt. That, that's my game reference for the day. <laughs> Overall, I think the series is really good. If someone wants a good, easy way to get into the games and learn the basic information they need to know from the first three games, the anime is a great way of doing it. Now, should it replace the games? I would say maybe skip the first game, maybe play the Rebirth 2 and 3, because as the games go, they have gotten progressively better. Now, I say that with the asterisk, I have not played Super Neptunia RPG, but everything up to that point has been a continuous upward spiral of of generally improving quality. So overall, guys, out of 10, what would you rank Hyperdimension Neptunia, the animation? Scale of 1 to 10, I give this series a Ray Wrights out of 10 because it's crazy, it's beautiful, and no one understands why I like it. I'm sorry, but what? Did you actually say a number, or are you just trying to be cute? No, I said a Ray Wrights out of 10, because it's crazy, it's beautiful, and no one understands why no, I like no, it. No, no, yeah, that's that's what I thought. I was just, like, staring here in disbelief, Professor. All right, I have to separate the entire game experience from the anime in my case. I'm going to have to give it a 7 out of 10. I think it's a good show. I think it's fun and lighthearted. However, in terms of Neptunia... Watching it, I felt like there was a lot more I needed to know or that I that they didn't quite adequately explain. Also, in terms of the animation about overall, it feels very much like a budget title. But regardless of that, I, I still had fun watching it. Dang it, Cog, you basically said everything I was going to say. I mean, I kind of disagree with the professor here. I feel that the games have merit, and I feel like he's just being an old fuddy-duddy because he decided, I'm going to do some dialogue heavy let's plays and didn't really consider and ultimately was like oh shit these are really long when they want to be and i want to you know show off every single event coming into them much later than him i feel that they have i i agree with him they get much better victory slash rebirth three and v2 are much better than rebirth one and rebirth two that being said the just comparing the the, sh- the series right here. Honestly, I, w- I would have to give it a 7 out of 10, too. It kind of assumes that you are going to have a prior knowledge. It's basically made, in my opinion, for the fans. This was made oh, yeah. for yeah. the fans just because it kind of just jumps in media res into things. And you don't really get the backstory that you get in the games. In the games, they actually explain to you the conflict between the four goddesses that leads ultimately to this kind of understanding that you get at the end of the series we just kind of ignore that and just kind of yeah we're all friends now yeah so i mean that being said as i as you said as well uh, i mean it's very budget there is money thrown into certain fights like the battle at the very end with ray rights in her tari goddess form I would say, yeah, I agree that that did seem to be one of the main fights that they obviously threw more money at and definitely upped the animation a bit. Oh, yeah. The one where they actually show off the conquest ending, which is a.k.a. the best ending, because Nepgear realizes, why am I dealing with you, you stupid weirdos? That in the OVA episode, the OVA definitely had a bit more budget behind it. (laughs) It it, it did make me laugh a bit at the end in the OVA when the trainees were having their, their bad ending sickness. Nepgear's ending, or Nepgear's little dreams, actually a reference to a 
really hard to get ending in Mark II, whereupon she gains basically not anime Stormbringer, uses it to kill her friends and her sister, and then uses that power to kill ultimate evil R4 and rule as the lone CPU over all of game industry. It's supposed to be a bad end when in a lot of ways I'm like, but ultimately that just proves that she's doing the right thing because, I mean, not for nothing, but the CPU spend a lot of times goofing off. She's the only one who seems like she's being proactive. Yeah, but she has an inferiority complex. She'd work herself to death. But anyways, uh, so yeah, I kind of agree that ultimately it's kind of a 6 out of 10. The the visuals are very, very bare bones. It, it basically coasts entirely off, ooh, look at these cute girls, and they're doing cute things, and it's kind of very fluffy. The individual character designs, as you can tell, where they put most of the, the detail in. Yeah, but that's kind of endemic to Neptunia in general. I was kind of worried ultimately, I'm like, oh... I didn't really tell Cog about what this series was like. I hope he's not going to come over and be like, ugh, ugh, stupid cute girls doing stupid cute things. I hate it. (laughs) You thought I was going to be like... Neptunia rises and falls on the quality of its characters. If you like the characters, you're going to like Neptunia. If you are, like, really cynical about it and, oh, they're just different TV tropes articles pasted on to girls and it's really dumb and I don't like it. You're not going to enjoy it. That's all there is to it. Can we put a pin into that TV tropes as girls thing? Because I, I want to talk about that later. Yeah. If you like the characters, you'll love the series. If you don't like the characters, you're not going to have a fun time. That, that's how Neptunia rolls. Yeah. No, I mean, so ultimately I think the animation is a value, but ultimately it's like, am I saying that you're going to, you know, be missing out? Not really. It's good. It's serviceable. But if you're not a fan of the games, you know, it's it's good. It's 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 a solid seven. Agreed. That's what I'd say. I continue my tradition of never assigning numbers to the things I review. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Pro Jared. I just say you you better you better be careful. Well, shall we figure out what we're watching next, gentlemen? Ah, that's a that is a good idea. So, all right, I got one. What I want to do is we're going to do Ninja Slayer, the animation. We got girls. Now we got to do manly man stuff now. Oh, you just you just jumped on one similar that I was going to bring up because my choice was actually going to be Inferno Cop. Oh, yes. <laughs> Studio Trigger. We're going to have Trigger Week. Mr. Snack. You know what this means. You have to do Kill a Kill and then we'll have SSSS Grid Man. This is how we're going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. I have one. It's a short series, too. It's not technically an anime, but it falls into the same kind of genre, and I'm going to maintain my stance. Are you going to put Avatar? What? I'm going to I'm going to walk over there right now and slap you if you put Avatar. Why would I? I don't like Avatar. Just, ooh, ooh, ooh. Controversial statement. I don't like Avatar. Fight me. <laughs> Controversial statement. <laughs> the series I'm putting forward is actually the animated series of Axe Cop. And what's our um, random option going to be? Okay, let me pull up the list. Wheel of Morality. Turn, turn, turn. Tell us the awful we will watch. (laughs) Uh, Heroic Age. Ooh, that's a good one. I have that one. It is good. It's done by Sunrise, as I recall, and it's got a lot of the people who did Gundam Seed. It's probably the best way of describing it. It's StarCraft the anime, and it is... Amazing. All right. Are we ready? Mr. Snack. My RNG hiccuped for a second and then rolled one three times in a row. So we are doing Ninja Slayer. All right. So join us for our next episode where we watch Ninja Slayer. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Tomodachi Brothers Review Podcast, produced and recorded by The Hipster Snack, Ditaku, and Cog. Sound design and editing by executive producer Sean Taylor Brown with Cog Sound Engineering. Music written and performed by Sean Taylor Brown with Costas Voss of Core Insight Studio on the drums. We hope you enjoyed this episode. 
See you next time. Hey everyone, thanks for listening to the Tomodochi Bros Anime Podcast. I'm one of the co-founders and co-hosts of the podcast, The Hipster Snack. If you want more content from me, I have my own YouTube channel, The Hipster Snack. Links will be available everywhere I can spam it up until I get a custom one, but all in due time. I do weekly game reviews, and in the future, probably more than that. Look forward to it, and I'll see you there and on Twitter, at Hipster Snack. See ya!